the next minute, don't make any sound. If you want to move, do it without making any sound. And I'm only going to make you do it for one minute. And go. The way cover bridge players, I guess, was born or came into be, um, back in 2010, a group of people, um, Neely Art Center, got together um, and decided to do a showing or a play. Um, it's a Wonderful Life. And I've always liked theater, how excited that I was that Mayberry actually was doing a show. So I auditioned um, and was cast in, the, in one of the roles. Loved the experience, met some wonderful people. Um, and there was a group, a core group of people that had talked about wanting this to continue, wanting to continue doing plays. And while there was a lot of talk, nothing really, just schedules and timing and, and lots of things came into play where we just really couldn't kick anything off. I wasn't actually involved in what springboarded the idea for a theater in Aniana. Um, the, the idea really was born out of the production of It's a Wonderful Life. And I remember seeing the ads for that. I just, I didn't make it out to see the show. And I regret not seeing that not, and not being involved in it. That group of people really enjoyed the experience, wanted something to happen. At, just at that point, it didn't materialize. In 2013, the um, Aniana Public Library decided they wanted to do a fundraiser and got together with Donna Drake, who said, let's do a dinner theater. Let's do a play at dinner theater. We were given space in Charlie B's. I got a call saying, hey, would you want to direct the show? Okay, and all I could do was cross my fingers and go, please let people show up. Please let somebody show up. My mother-in-law saw the audition notice for The Foreigner in the local paper in the Blake County Inn. And she pointed it out to me and in front of my mother-in-law, I said, oh, wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, I might, I might go check that out. And in my head, because my, my extensive theatrical background and having worked in Birmingham for 10 years and all this other stuff. And I almost snobbed myself right out of the opportunity because I wasn't going to go to the audition because I'm not going to, these people know what they're doing. And then basically at the last minute, I, I went, oh, just go. I started, thank goodness for Facebook, started contacting people that were in um, the previous show and said, please, please, please come on the audition. I need, be, you know, we're going to try to put this together. And they did. They came out. Um, Patricia Williams, Paul Kelly, um, Ashley Allen, so some of that core group that were serious about it came and auditioned. So I show up at the audition and Karen was at the audition, read my best and introduced myself to Karen and said, you know, if you need any help with sets, I, I do that sort of thing as well. And she uh, contacted me on Facebook a couple, of days, a couple of days later and asked me to play the role of Catherine in The Foreigner, um, which was done as a project or as a fundraiser for the summer's, the library summer reading program. We saw the turnout for that and went, okay, wow, this is, they, they weren't joking. They really want to do this more. And, and the audience turned out for it, which is really, you know, it's great to get people on stage. But if you don't have people watching you, that doesn't really do anything. We performed three, three shows of The Foreigner in a tiny little corner of Charlie B's restaurant. And first night, we were at about half house. We could seat about 100 people. Oh, we might not have been at half house. I think we had 40 people there. Um, the next night the crowd doubled because Facebook blew up after the show. Everybody talking about how great it was. You've got to come out and see this. And then the, the third show on Saturday night, we were turning people away at the door. And that was a, that was a $40 ticket. So <laughs> at that point there was definitely an interest because people were willing to, to pay that to not only get a good meal but to get a really good evening of entertainment. And from there, that group of people said, we've got to keep this going. Through some meetings, again, that group was kind of pushing it and we're really going to make it happen this time. We met at the gym. We've met at several different places, and um, said we're going to let's do this and put together uh, a board of directors, an initial board of directors. We were at the school and kind of drew names out of hats. <laughs> we, you know, it was, you know, what are we going to call the place? And that that kind of went up in the air, um, but that was kind of the the foundling pieces of it. Karen started pounding pavement, found this space and uh, she really invested her heart and soul. And I came along for the ride. I was the muscle, <laughs> the, the brawn behind the brains. By October, we'd had space. We were putting on our first show. The turnout was fabulous and it was, okay, let's do it. It took from 2010 to the end of 2013 to make it solidify. And 
we've basically two women who won't take no for an answer <laughs> cannot be stopped because we've we built a theater. The very first production I ever appeared in was actually the Christmas play at my kindergarten. <laughs> it was. I played Mary in the Christmas play in kindergarten when I was five years old. Right. I was a bit early. The first play I remember being in was um, a little church school nativity type play and I was the star and literally I was the star shining to guide people but I was about five years old and I got to come home and say I'm the star of the play and that was that started it all. The moment I realized that I wanted to be an actor was I saw the movie version of the Martian Norman play called Night Mother with Sissy Spacek and Anne Bancroft and it's it's a very sad play when you get right down to it but the, the power of the emotion and the way that those two actresses conveyed it just got me right to the core. Mm -hmm. And something in me went, I want to do that. <laughs> I want to be able to affect people like that. The first play that I was ever in that I went, oh wow, I, I can really do this, was um, a play called Our Country's Good that I did my sophomore year in college. And it was the, it's about the colonization of Australia with British prisoners who were shipped out of Great Britain into Australia. When I decided I wanted to do this for a living, or at least as a very time-consuming hobby, <laughs> I was eight or nine years old, had a wonderful mentor, her name was Jeanette Cheney, and she cast me as Helen Keller in The Miracle Worker. And it was the most wonderful experience. I remember having 104, I had mono during the run of the show and remember sleeping underneath tables and chairs. Um, I, it was my first quick changes, I would leap, exit one side of the stage and change and come back on. And at eight, that was just the most thrilling thing I'd ever seen. And it's what kept my grades up, it's what kept me in school, It's it was my life. I ended up going to the School of Fine Arts and uh, in Birmingham and have stayed in it ever since. I eventually went to work about the time I was 19 or 20 through with Paramount Pictures and worked as a props buyer and a location scout and worked with them for about three years. Um, then I decided to join the real world and went back to school, got a business degree, worked in human resources um, and I did that for 18 years. Um, until recently I was an HR executive with a very large company, and all the while I had stayed in community theater. Uh, I would say on average about one show a year. Um, there were times down in Jacksonville, Florida and South Florida that I, were, I was doing three and four um, a year. Um, so I knew it was a passion, but I just, whether it was fear of rejection or, or fear of money, <laughs> I just didn't pursue that. Um, and then recently uh, I decided I wanted to do it. I wanted to have you know, something good on my tombstone and left a 20-year career and six-figure salary and poured my, dumped my life savings into cover bridge players and um, decided to go back to school. And I am now two semesters away from a theater degree as well. Currently I'm in a performance uh, major and directing, so um, I'm on Shakespeare tour and stage managing a show and I wrote a play that will be in production so I'm, I'm burning candle at both ends but have never been happier so um, it's been about a 38 year career. I graduated from Oneonta High School in 1992. After graduation I went directly to Birmingham Southern, lived on campus in Birmingham Southern and when I graduated I immediately got a job as tour technical director with Birmingham Children's Theater so I lived in Birmingham for about 10 years after college. My degree is in theater arts with an emphasis in technical direction and lighting design. That involves being able to design and build scenery, being able to hang and focus lights, knowing the difference between what color conveys different emotions. So it's, there's a lot of psychology involved in lighting that a lot of people don't realize because colors can affect people. Intensity of light, dimness or brightness can affect people's emotions. 
there's a, a deep psychological understanding that goes on there, and plus a technical knowledge of, of tools and lumber and hardware and all that sort of thing as far as building. I think my greatest achievement was a play called um, The Musical Comedy Murders of 1940 that I did at Birmingham Festival Theater. The set was a character in that show. There were all these secret passageways that had to be opened at the right time and the people had, in a very tiny space, people had to be able to duck behind and get through and you couldn't really, weren't supposed to see where they were going and had to mask the backstage area, which through a lot of them you could see that. One that had a bookshelf that had to open like a door and another bookshelf that pivoted so you could move, move on either side of it and, and then another set of bookshelves that were side by side and one of them slid back and slid behind the other one to open um, a secret passageway. And that one, that one I consider my, my crowning achievement because it took me a good bit of figuring out how to make all those tricks work. My biggest achievement in theater and probably in life other than my children, is this theater, is Covered Bridge. It's, people said I was crazy. I was pretty sure I was crazy myself, if not taking copious amounts of drugs somewhere. And it's turned out wonderfully. So um, this is definitely my crowning moment. My senior year in college, my greatest disappointment was that we, al we always do a mini term show in January. And I thought my senior year, I really would be on stage because I got a theater scholarship off of an audition to Birmingham Southern. So I was there to act. And it was, it was there that I also discovered my love of the technical side of it. But I really wanted to be a lead role in my senior year. And I went into that audition completely off book. The, the, both of the directors who were watching the auditions laughed through my audition, thanked me for preparing so well. So I felt really confident about that. And then I went into my technical interview and the technical director told me that he wanted me to student technical direct that production. So in that moment, I basically knew that I wasn't getting cast. <laughs> so that was a pretty big disappointment, but that set was really good. I guess my biggest disappointment is more in myself than theater. Um, I really wish I had gone, when I was young and sprite, I really wish I had done the New York Chicago thing um, and decided to have a real life. And now that I'm 40, I'm coming back to it. So I, that was probably the biggest disappointment. <laughs> you just moved halfway across the country, so I kind of counted on her checking in at least ten times by noon. Huh. Yeah, well... We auditioned a good ways out so that we give, us, give ourselves as directors time to mull over the options and, and really put together the best cast we can. Um, that was... <sighs> this, this audition process was, was rough. <laughs> I had a sleepless night after that audition because there were so many talented young girls who showed up for this audition and the choice was so hard, so hard, because I had several options that would have been really good. Um, but we also had to consider age as a factor because of the, some of the subject matter of the show. Didn't want to cast too young um, for some of the, the speeches that Anne has get a little, a little involved in the life of a teenage girl. So we had to, <laughs> had to be very careful <laughs> in age range of who we cast as Anne. Um, but that, that's a fantastic problem to have. I was very, very glad that we had that problem because again, it shows that Aniana is very interested in this and especially the young people in Aniana are interested in this and that's really what we want to tap into is catching them early and getting them interested and giving them an artistic outlet. As the director of this show, I get the creative license as, as much as I can have with a true story they're, they're real people that you can go back and research what actually happened to them. So I feel as a director, I am very challenged to stay true to this story, to, to, do, these people, to, to do the story justice and to tell these people's story the way it needs to be told. Um, so that, that, that's a tremendous directorial challenge. But it also means there's lots of historical stuff <laughs> to help me along the way. Um, with fiction works, you don't really have that. You have a little more artistic freedom, but you don't have the historical stuff to kind of back you up. So I'm, I'm very excited about getting to do this show because I think it's a very important story that needs to be told. And looking forward to, or just from seeing what we've gotten in rehearsal so far, the, the group of, of actors that, that showed up and that I got, to, I got to put together to put on stage for the show is phenomenal. It's very, very powerful, very emotional. Being as this is a, a very, poignant story to 
world history, not only American history. We're very grateful to have the opportunity to go into the school systems. Um, Aniana is working with us to be able to present this to the eighth and ninth grade history classes in Aniana, which is basically, we get to teach a lesson on stage. We get to teach a lesson by bringing it to life and letting kids see. Reading out of a textbook is one thing, but you see real life people acting out what these people went through for real. To me, makes a much, much more lasting impression than reading about it in a textbook. Anybody can go read a textbook or look up something online, but to see it live in person and see what they really went through, to see the chaos that ensues after these people have been trapped here for two years, to see the heartbreak that they were betrayed, they were captured, they didn't make it. After everything they went through to try to survive, they didn't make it. And like I said, we just, we just want to do that story justice because all that's left to tell that story is this diary. A show like this is very challenging for a theater as small as we are because we are very limited by space. Um, it's a challenge and a benefit in, in some ways because the space they were in was very small. So for us to convey how cramped they were <laughs> is very truthful because we are very cramped in, in this space. But limiting in that we have a very limited space to represent where they were. Where they were was an attic and was a two-story attic and the things that we need to see happen on the second floor I've, I've got to represent that they're up on a second floor. So the height, I would love to have more height, <laughs> um, but having to build two stories inside, under, under 12 feet is very very limiting and you hope for very short actors who have to go up on the top platform, which luckily we have. Um, but just conveying the different areas of the stage with very limited space and very limited lighting. Um, we've kind of pulled together what we have from several different sources and we're still working on building our inventory in that respect. What I love about this space is that because it's so small, I have to challenge myself into how do I make it fit? How do I make it work? That's, that's where my brain really starts spinning. And how do I make each show different? Because we, we keep saying, we keep joking, oh, this one's better than the last one. Oh, this set's better than the last one. So I, I, I'm kind of, every time I make the shoes a little bigger <laughs> that I have to fill for the next show, which is great because I love, I love a challenge. I love continuing to challenge myself. But as far as this one in particular, it's, it's a pro and a con. We are cramped into the space physically and literally crammed into the space, but they were too. So for us to be to have that luxury of being able to say, hey, yeah, we're, we're crammed in here like sardines, but so were they. And I do have the opportunity to sort of show different levels of where the action is taking place. And that gives me, as a director, that gives me the opportunity to create some really beautiful pictures with people, you know, moving pictures on stage. Um, so that, that's one of the things that I really love about getting to do theater is I get to be kind of a creator. I, I, I make worlds <laughs> where, where things happen. And I know that that's arrogant to say, but I view it as a blessing because I, I've been given just a little T90 fraction of a fraction of a fraction of something that God can do, which is create. And if he's blessed me with that kind of talent, then oh boy, how I'm going to use it as best I can. I definitely love to to work on the historical ones to see how close I can get to the real thing. This is a story that the whole world knows. You know, everybody is aware of what happened during this time period. Everybody knows what the Jewish people were going through in, in that area, in this time period. And to, to cheapen that in any way by not telling it honestly, by not showing the hardships that these people went through, to try to lighten it or to try to, to make it prettier than it was, to try to, can, try to sugarcoat it or candy coat it or whatever, I think is not, is not being honest to, about what these people went through. You want to keep this history alive because you don't ever want it to repeat itself. I chose Anna Fry to play Anne Frank, partially because of physicality, because we do have pictures of Anne that we can go back and look at, so I wanted to go, I wanted to choose someone who could already looked a little like her, could be made to look a little like her, and there is a, a physical similarity there. But also Anna has such a personality, a very 
vibrant personality. And that was one of the things about, about Anne that stuck out to me in this script is that through all of it, she's the one who's still got hope. She's the one who's still trying to see that silver lining around the cloud and, and trying to get everybody to, to, to still be cheerful and to, to stay hopeful. So Anna is definitely a, a very vibrant young woman and certainly brings that to the character. Morgan Fletcher is playing Margot, her older sister. And Margot is the, she's the smart older sister that everybody has to try to be. <laughs> um, I can actually kind of relate to Anne in a little bit of that because I was always compared to my older sister, so I know how that goes. But um, Margot is, is, she's the quieter one. She's the, she's the smart one. But then she's also, there's a great deal of fear in her because they had to go into hiding because she was the one who was called up to, to go to the to work camps. So there is a, a sheepishness and a, a, a fear in her. And Morgan's audition was very, almost, there was almost a cowering to her and her facial expressions were fantastic. Um, so I really landed on her almost immediately. Paul Kelly is Otto Frank. There's the monologue at the end. He read it in the audition and basically everybody in the, in the audition room was in tears. So that's, <laughs> expecting the audience to be that way as well. I, 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 I have no doubt in my mind that there will not be a dry eye in the house. Um, Jenny King as Mrs. Frank. She was actually in the audition just reading because in case we needed a warm body, but then came up to me after the audition and said, you know, if you need me to be in this show, I'm willing to be in the show. And just in one week of rehearsal, her instincts are off the charts. She, she keeps saying how she doesn't do this, she's not any good at this, but every time I turn around, she, she is Edith Frank. She is the, the, the worrywart mom and the trying to keep everybody calm and how do we, let's, let's take care of this, let's make sure everything is running smoothly. Um, Ron Dolphany as um, Mr. Van Dan, I was so very happy when I saw him walk into the auditions because I know Ron has done extensive work in theater, film, all that kind of stuff. And he's just, Mr. Van Dan strikes me as, the, as, as a man who's, who's very proud of himself, who's very um, set in his ways, and he's, he's earned everything that he's gotten, and he feels like he's, he deserves it. Um, so there's a, a boisterous sort of, there's, just, there's a, a bigness to Mr. Van Dan that's, that Ron has certainly captured. Um, Noah Duffy as Peter, just he had that sweet innocence and just the he just he captured he, he just gave off a, a peter vibe just the that nice little you know punky little 16 year old <laughs> who was uh you know hated the situation he was in a typical 16 year old fighting with his parents and you know just he, he nailed it and then patricia williams as mrs van dan patricia is a very fun person and mrs van dan is is as well. She's got you know. She loves her fur coat, and she had all her boyfriends when she was younger, and and she's a little prissy, which I know Patricia can can play prissy. <laughs> um, but it's just a such a fun group. And um, Zach Views as Mr. Dussel. Um, some of the research I've done says that that Mr. Dussel is a bit of a ladies' man. And um, those of you who know Zach well, Zach fancies himself. <laughs> as a little bit of a ladies man as well. Or at least he'll joke with you about it. I don't know that he really feels that way, but he will certainly joke with you about it. Um, so, and honestly, I could put Zach in as a dog and he would do a fantastic job as a dog. So I know I can, I can, I can trust Zach. Um, and then Lee Alexander is Mr. Crayler. Lee's got that, uh, the, the big presence on stage and um, the soft spoken enough to be very secretive and which is what Crayler needs to be. And then Ashton Clemens as Meep is again, that young, vibrant, just we needed that personality for Meep to be a little bubbly. Um, it was just an amazing, amazing group of people that I was so very lucky they showed up. The first year where we only had three, um, it was a really good, nice time span. We could cast a show and rehearse it for a good two months and put one on. Now that we're running five shows, we do every five or every other month, um, except for the summers. We have auditions in between our current showing. Um, one that's exciting for actors to come in and see a really cool set and and feel that vibe and the theater's clean <laughs> when they do that. The Sunday that we close one show. 
we'll completely strip that set down, start building the next, and start rehearsals that following week for the, for the next show. That's giving us about a month and a half um, between shows for actors to get off book and know their lines, to build a complete set and have it completely dressed, and then to do all of that marketing and print work and um, any upgrades we need to do to the theater. Then you get hold of them and y'all tug of war. Count when? And then tug of war. Ooh, you're strong. It's when I say here and then. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm like, here. Oh, you're strong. But you won't get them away from me. You didn't think I was so strong, did you? Oh, you're getting mad. You didn't really not now. A lot of people know that there are directors and there's actors, um, even people working light boards and sound boards. Um, and they have always seen the title stage manager in the programs, but they're not real sure what that really does. Stage management. Um, the simple terms is once you go into production, once that very first show opens, the director's job is over. It becomes the stage manager's show. And those are very, very simplistic terms on what it does. The stage manager, during a run of a show, is responsible for making sure cues or the actor gets out to the stage on time, that props are out there when it's supposed to happen, that the stage is clean, the stage is safe. Um, during rehearsals for a show, they do everything from watch your script, and do line calls um, and line notes if actors not really getting his lines correctly because we owe it to the author of that particular play to do the right words. There's a reason they're in there that way. Um, they're constantly taking notes of what it is that we need and when we need it and how we need it and who goes when. So even while the actors are rehearsing, the stage manager is rehearsing how they're going to do their job. Um, and backstage is a ballet. It's always a ballet and you've got to do it the exact same way every single time or you will forget something. Um, they're there for the um, oh no factor. <laughs> you know, they're, they're always the one um, trying to decide what will happen if or what do we do if this occurs. And that takes a lot of the weight off the director to be able to just draw out some of the wonderful things out of an actor um, and to really pay attention to the dialogue and to really pay attention to the way the actors are working with that dialogue and not have to worry about the rest of it and know that things are going to happen the way they're going to do. Um, so stage manager actually has a lot, a lot going on. Having been an actor, um, I come into the, the process with a, a vision of how things should look, how things should sound, how things should move. So. Certainly having been an actor been, is a benefit to, to coming in as a director. As a director, I certainly encourage um, creative input from the actors, especially in a, in a project like this where they're playing real people, where they are, they can go research what happened to the character that they play, what, you know, research what kind of person they were, how they got to where they, where they are in the play. And whatever they want to bring to the table, I welcome. Some things work, some things don't. Um, but I, I certainly encourage research on their own and anything they want to bring to the table. As the director, I get to, to decide what fits together and what doesn't, what fits my vision and what doesn't. Having been there and knowing how it should sound, how it should look, how it should feel, um, the, the emotion that I, I want the actor to convey, or having been in a place where I had to convey that emotion myself, I feel like I can, I can kind of bring something to the table and kind of guide them toward being able to put, to put that out there for the audience to feel. Because that's, honestly, that's, that's really what, what theater is about. You're encouraging emotion from people. The more powerful the emotion coming from the actors, the more impact it's gonna have on the audience. So to really in, inspire them to, to get in touch with that emotion, to dig deep and just lay it all out there. And having been an actor on stage who has done that, I feel like I can I bring a, a little bit more a little rope to kind of pull it out of them. From an actor standpoint, having been a director, um, a tremendous amount of respect <laughs> for the pressures on a director to bring a show to life. Um, try to come in completely prepared. Try to you know know your lines, having done your research, and be ready to give them everything they ask for times 10 so you can back off from it come you know come to the table with your with your research done come to the table with um, with ideas to try and be willing to accept criticism be willing to to not 
take it personally if somebody tells you, no, I don't like that, do something else. Okay, cool. That's, you know, that, that's creative challenge. Okay, cool, I could, I could think about it again. I could try, try another, another avenue. Um, so certainly a tremendous amount of respect for directors having been on the other side of it or having been on both sides of it um, just to know how the, how the two have to work together and have to meld. Your goal is to create that world, create that picture that brings the audience into that world with you so that everybody gets to experience this. How can we thank you? Really? How can we ever? I never thought I'd live to see the day when a man like Mr. Frank would have to go into hiding. Uh, what a journey! <laughs> it's a wonder we weren't arrested! Some of the ways that, they, that directing and acting influence each other, at least personally for me, is for example, when I'm directing, uh, and I'm directing some pieces at UAB right now, I write something down as a director in blocking and try to pre-block or, or pre-decide where people are going to be on the stage. Um, but I also know what it feels like as an actor, um, how that feels. So rather than say, go A, go B, go C, it's I need you to get to C via B, however you get there. Um, and really let that actor work with those pieces um, and having an end goal in sight. So having been a, an actor, I hope, really influences my directing really well. Um, having directed, it's much easier to be an actor um, because I, can s I know what the director's having to go through. Uh, even new directors that I've never worked with, um, while I might not understand their methodologies or where they're trying to go, I do understand what they're having to work with um, and what they have to get done to make something go off. So um, it makes acting at least, I don't pull the actor card very as, as often as I used to and say, that just doesn't feel natural, that doesn't feel good. Um, because now having directed, I get it. I understand why lights have to work in a certain way. So I think it's just made me a much more well-rounded um, theater person. So I'm directing the next show, which is Things My Mother Taught Me, and it's a Southeast premiere. Um, it's played several times in the Northeast of the country. I love directing. I, I think I found a new passion with directing. As much as I love stage managing and coming from acting, um, I really, really like directing, and I think both those experiences as an actor and a stage manager have made me um, not only love directing, but I think it's making me a better director. Um, that and watching other fabulous directors from Birmingham Festival and University of Alabama, Birmingham, um, hold backstage, of just seeing and, and working with better directors my, than myself. Um, one of the biggest challenges in shifting from stage manager over to directing is letting go of a lot of things um, and not trying to um, get mired in the minuscule. Uh, I, don't, I don't need to worry about that, that stage manager job. Um, and being able to focus on that dialogue. Um, one of the things that's hardest being a director coming from an acting background is not telling the actors how to portray something or, or how to feel or how to emote um, and just leaving that to their creative um, rights and their abilities um, and just opening all the doorways for them. Um, it's a very different show. I love, I'm comedy. I love comedy. I like fall down, slapstick, Carol Burnett, Chevy Chase, you know, big guffaws. Um, and it's a very different show than this, uh, than Anne Frank. Anne Frank is, is heavy dramatic, which Mindy is wonderful with and drawing that out of actors. You can't do that. They'll arrest you to go out without your star. Who's going out? Now I don't have to be branded. You're right. You don't need it anymore. <laughs> okay, people, look professional. The press is in the room. <laughs> Coverbridge Players has one of the most outstanding board of directors. When we started to get this whole thing together, I read a book by these two kids out of Northwestern University that had started Congo Square in Chicago. Very, very um, well-known theater. And went up to visit them and see how everything ran. But one of the things they said were, was have a business board. Don't have a typical theater artsy board. While you want your board members to support the arts and, and understand it, you need a business board. And that's what we did. 
the board is our backbone. Um, it takes a lot more to, to put, a show, put up a show than a lot of people realize. We, we rely on them to, to keep us on the right path because artistic, artistic people have a tendency to want to wander off on a tangent and we, we do have delusions of grandeur because we want everything to be big and, and pretty and, <laughs> and colorful, um, but it takes money to make big and pretty and colorful. So how to do theater on a shoestring is something that community theaters have to learn really quick. But our board of directors is a true working board. They work. Um, it's not a show up once a month and you know pretend to have a vote on something. They they really are. We have an attorney. We have um, an auditor. We have a restaurateur at business owners. We have uh, fundraisers. We have art artists. Um, we've got marketing specialists. Um, all of them are just brilliant people and they're very good at what they do. There's a play reading committee. They read all of the different plays and take submittals um, and determine whether or not it would work in our community or not. Um, they're the ones that kind of decide if we're going to push the envelope, if we're not going to. They also do the simple things like run the box office and concessions during shows. It's definitely a, a dedication that we appreciate. Uh, Mindy and I both report to the board, um, which is good. They, they definitely take us at our word, you know, it's our responsibility to make sure a show goes off. Um, but then we rely on them to, to make sure that this business survives with or without us. When they come here for their meetings, and I've been to a couple of them, for an hour it's non-stop conversations. Um, we're looking at buying a building in the next couple years. Um, we want to expand our space and that's on their docket is to to make those connections and decide what's best for us. As far as the administrative, I mean, we, we're renting the space, so we have to pay rent, we have to pay the power bill, we have to we have to keep the doors open by making money however we can, and our ticket sales are our, our big money maker. So we have to make sure we get the word out about our shows, we have to do get our posters and our all of our advertising out and make sure we're really flooding social media as much as we can. And our board helps a lot with that. And we're, we're in here every night, and we're in here doing the nitty gritty, we're in here going over and over and over a scene until we get it right. Um, some of us are staying after rehearsal to crawl around in sawdust and get the set built or put up the lights or paint. Um, we're in here on the weekends, we give up our holidays. You know, when, the, when the banks are closed and the kids aren't in school, we're here. <laughs> Before anybody can walk through the door and sit down and see a show, there is a lot that goes on. From the second we decide to do a show, we've got to apply for rights, we've got to have the money to do that and they range anywhere from $75 to $200 a piece, and that's per show. So if we're doing six shows, it could be $600 to $1,000, just to be able to hold the scripts in our hands. Um, then we do auditions, hope that people show up. Um, a lot of my job is getting the word out there and making contacts and, and talking to different theaters to see if they have any actors that, that aren't working currently. Then we've got to set ticket prices write tickets, get posters designed. Um, I spend probably a good week all totaled in just ticketing, ticket sales, seating, um, making sure that everybody has their places, um, you know, donors if they got the best sight lines, um, trying to judge if we need to add an extra show and do it before it's last minute so that we have enough time to get rights. Um, so between getting programs printed in the newspaper, posters, all of just the sheer advertising work that goes on behind it. There's um, also paying rent and upgrades, having people come in and clean, making sure we have food, making sure we have drinks, um, that we have seats that are comfortable to sit in. We've got um, the, all of the different pieces that we need to build a set, to put costumes together. I spend at least once a week shopping for costumes and working with the different directors, um, buying fabric and building those pieces <laughs> from scratch. There is so much that happens right before you walk through the door. Um, so my job is pretty much done once I get to open that front door. Um, I always say my job is to put, get people through the door and then it's over with. And then I turn around and start doing it again for the next show.